welcome to the 10th anniversary of Viva El Bajo and the first ever Viva El Bajo Live. I'm so glad to have you here. I'm going to be hosting this event. My name is Jason Heath. We've got a great evening packed with activities, giveaways, performances. We're going to be chatting with some of the people that have been working with the students this week. And we're going to kick off tonight with the UTRGV double bass quartet. They're going to play two selections for you, and then we're going to chat with them and their professor, Dr. George Amarim, who's put this event together. So let's give a hand to the UTRGV bass quartet.
MTRGB Bass Quartet. Aren't they fabulous? These gentlemen are going to put their in some sway and join us on the couch for a few questions. And that reminds me, anybody who's watching this on Facebook Live, thanks for tuning in. And if you have any questions for these fine folks or anybody else we're talking to tonight, feel free to type them in and we will try to get to them here. And I, I, if you're, whether or not you're familiar with bass playing, the, the level of bass playing that you just heard, that's a rare thing. And it's a real testament to the work that's done here and the culture of the music school here and the bass program here and to what Dr. Amarim has built here. I, you can hear it with your ears, through both of those selections and bravo to Gabriel for that wonderful arrangement. And uh, have a seat, gentlemen. It'll be nice and cozy up here. So, what, Dr. Amarim, what, what was the bass program like uh, before you got here? How many, how many students were at school here? Do you re recall? Yeah, there were nine. There were nine? <laughs> bass program. No students. And a bass festival? Uh, no bass festival. No bass festival. Okay. And what have the numbers for this bass festival been like the last several years? What, what have we gotten into? It's, 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 it fluctuates, but uh, it goes for... Dozens to hundreds, and that's uh, uh, what really to us that counts is uh, the motivation for people to come. And I think that everybody who comes gets something out of it and gets excited and ready for the year. And that's exactly what we're here to do. I think events like this are just so important. I, I remember back to my time in school, and I would learn as much during these few days as I would during an entire year of, of school. What, what? What's beneficial while doing an event like this for the students? Well, um, besides, uh, I think the I just told a couple, uh, a family actually yesterday, that this is an analogy of getting a burning piece of coal out of the fire. You just put it there for a little bit, uh, you put it off to the side. It's just so long that it can still burn. So the secret is gathering, the secret is the closeness and the being together, sharing ideas, being excited about um, what you do, what other people are doing, and see where you stand and knowing that help is right there next stand or, or somebody who is willing to, to share a, a tip or an insight, and um, I think this is priceless. Aren't you worried that all these opinions of all these clinicians coming in, aren't you worried they're going to confuse your students and they're going to stop listening to what you're saying? Uh, confusing, yes, that's great. <laughs> that's exactly. Uh, we want them to feel, um, to stretch their minds. We want to make informed decisions about music, about a passage, about a technique, about a musical idea. And um, having these wonderful guests here for these days, it's... Um, Something uh, I think one of the motivations to start this festival was to bring the world to the RGB, and um, and this has happened because look at these guests. They come from all over the world. They come all the way from San Francisco, like you, uh, a worldwide personality, like a, a media uh, guru such as yourself. It's sitting here with us, and this is this is incredible. Like um, to be able to bring those guests and those influences, those ways of, different ways of seeing music and education and training. And of course, in the, in the meantime, students start getting excited about traveling abroad and doing festivals and uh, participating in things like this in different places. I had the chance to see these, these four individuals play in Prague, which was a fabulous experience, and I'm sure you had a great time in Prague and coming back from Istanbul. And I was wondering, gentlemen, if you could maybe share a few thoughts about your experience studying here. Uh, do you have any fun stories you'd like to share? Your time? Uh, in the, uh, <laughs> studying here. here? <laughs> studying here, playing in the bass quartet. Oh, I think studying here's been really nice, actually. Yeah, he's a really wonderful teacher. And uh, that's good. Uh, the trip to Prague was pretty interesting. I, I don't know if maybe you guys want to say anything about it. <laughs> I feel there's a story here that... <laughs> I think then you would like to tell a, a funny story about the trip. 
I think that there's many stories, but most of them are inappropriate. Oh. <laughs> There is actually plenty of stories, and um, for and one good thing that came out of that trip, it was um, a new piece that we will premiere in Ithaca called A Night in Istanbul, because we had the longest layover in Istanbul because it was the only flight we could afford, and since we didn't have a hotel, we just started wandering around the city and seeing the sights and smelling the smells and eating the food and drinking a lot of coffee and um, eating baklava. So um, we don't remember much of what happened because we were sleep deprived and with so much caffeine and sugar in our, our bodies. And I think uh, Dr. Justin Ryder, our composition professor here, he is the one who just, the one piece that we took to Prague and he, he came to the trip with us. And I asked him uh, maybe a couple months ago to write this piece. A night in Istanbul. It's very descriptive for all the, the things that we endured during the, those hours in Istanbul. So um, stay tuned. Probably we're gonna stream our concert from Ithaca as well, and you're gonna get to hear it firsthand. That's great. Yeah. Well, thanks, gentlemen. Congratulations on everything that you've done and great playing. And I look forward to seeing you in a couple weeks in Ithaca as well. So thank you. There's so many great clinicians that, that are at this event and have been at this event over the past 10 years. It's such a, it's an honor for me to, to join them this year. And I, I'd like to welcome to the stage another clinician that's joining for the first time this year, Lloyd Goldstein, who has just a, a, the most interesting and touching and heartwarming and inspiring career that you can imagine as a musician. I, I wish we had three hours to chat. Maybe Lloyd doesn't, but I wish we did. And I, I'd love to have Lloyd just share a little bit about the work that he does and what he's been doing here uh, in South Texas the last few days. And maybe if you feel moved, play a, a little bit on the bass for us. So welcome, Lloyd. There's a world-class cancer center in my town in Tampa, Florida. And uh, I went down there and talked to them and I found out that they had this remarkable program, uh, arts and medicine program, and that I wouldn't be allowed to play at the bedside unless I was trained, unless I had special training. And, but they did invite me to play in some of the lobbies and waiting rooms and I just fell in love with the experience of playing intimately for people in a way that was a trying to be of service to them. And uh, I, I, I decided to get the training and eventually about two and a half years into that process of uh, volunteering there, I left the orchestra and I have been playing there, working there as a certified music practitioner for the last 10 years, celebrated my 10th anniversary there this year. So it's been amazing. I think the main thing the, the very main uh, lesson that I take away from working there is um, is that music at its heart is meant to move people, is meant to touch people and to help them to process uh, emotions, uh, difficult circumstances. I think we all know what it's like to come home from a stressful day at work and maybe self-medicate a little bit with some rock and roll maybe or uh, who knows what, and um, uh, I have found that just uh, offering music in this way as a service has changed the way that I, even that I perform in a situation like this, which would normally be very nerve-wracking, um, uh, just to think of it instead of showing yourself, of sharing a gift with people. And the other thing, the main, the other big takeaway is the people teach me how to play. Where they are in the moment, what they're like as a person, their graciousness, their courage, the good things that the music brings out in them inspire me to play better and differently than I ever would under normal circumstances. So it's a very cool job. Would you mind playing something for us like, like you would do in that?
love to welcome to the stage a person that's been a major inspiration for me ever since I was a teenager, has had a major effect on the bass community globally for decades, has done well over a thousand master classes and performances probably on every continent except Antarctica. Maybe he's done that in Antarctica, I don't know. But I'd love to welcome to the stage Jeff Bradovich. So Jeff, you were the, in addition to being the teacher of many people at this event, you were the featured artist for the first year of Viva El Bajo, and now you're back for the 10th year, played a fabulous recital yesterday, it's so great to hear you play. What were some of the, in case people weren't here for that, what were some of the pieces you played on the recital? Uh, last night was Beethoven and Bloch, uh, Bloch I find to be a wonderful composer for the bass, even though he didn't write it for yeah. the bass, the bass brings out his music and, and uh, then shared some ensemble pieces with some of my colleagues. Yeah. But your, your son, we, we spoke, George, and George spoke at the beginning about the International Society of Bases Convention coming up in Ithaca in a few weeks. And Jeff is somebody that has been an integral part, not only to that organization, he basically ran that organization for about to about a decade uh, back in when he was at Northwestern, um, but also just the bass community in general. And I'd love to know that you played your Carnegie Hall recital back in the, when was that that you did that? My New York debut was in 1982. 1982. And I'm going back uh, finally again to the same hall in uh, November of this, November 17th, November. to thir almost exactly 35 years to the day of my debut. And there's some other, this is a, a momentous year, and a, I remember when we were chatting before, there's some other, this year lines up well. What are some of the other... Uh, this is, this is a, amazing how it's all come together on the sevens. I, I guess sevens are supposed to be unlucky, but uh, uh, I turned 60 this year. I've been playing the bass for 50 years. Um, it's the 30th anniversary of my summer master classes, uh, my 35th year in, since my debut. And my double bass is 250 years old to this year. So, <laughs> what the heck? What, what are those all total, I wonder? I'm not sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, a lot of people talk about this being kind of a period of revolution for the bass these last few decades. What, how have you seen the bass develop, maybe just a, as an instrument in general, and then maybe as a solo instrument also? It's, it's been quite a riot, actually. Um, when I was young, I, in high school, I studied with a cellist, and the cellist expected the same of me on the bass as he did his cello students, and I said, okay, you know, I, I can do that, or I can try. And then I got to college, and what are you doing playing solos on the bass, I was told. Uh, you just stick to the money positions, and, and that's all you have to do. One solo is all you need. And that didn't quite fit my mentality and my desire to, to play on the bass, and uh, so, uh, you know, and before me, of course, was Gary Carl, uh, not that long before me, but but uh, he had to fight this as well, that not just for bass players, but the general public, well, the bass is not a solo instrument, therefore, what are you doing? And he really opened doors that uh, the rest of us have all been able to follow through, and, and nowadays, you see all these young people, I don't think they, they know, they don't know life without soul playing on the bass. So it's been 30 years or so, I've been teaching now 37 years, and uh, it's been a, a major change in that regard. Um, what are the, uh, there's a number of factors for that, obviously Gary Carr and breaking down uh, uh, stereotypes, but uh, the ISB has been a major, the International Society of Bass, Basis, a major factor within our profession for bass players coming together and and uh, I was fortunate to uh, uh, host and, and start the conventions for the ISB back in 1984 uh, when I was in Chicago and uh, I ran the first four of them and the reason I felt it was really necessary to 
to do something like this because it hadn't really been done before and certainly the other instruments you still don't have violin conventions that'll never happen um, but the violas and the cellos get together all the time now just like we do but we we did it first and uh, the reason was because I personally I saw that we just needed to get together to share our ideas because what was going on in France nobody knew, knew about in Spain and what was going on in Germany nobody knew about in, in America and, and what we were doing here nobody else knew about because there weren't many recordings it's very hard to make recordings in those days certainly no internet no YouTube so forth. so coming together was was the key and then people learn from each other and uh, pretty soon that blossomed into what it is today where people plan their vacations two years in advance so they are free on the week of the ISB convention. It's become such a community of, of uh, people coming together plus the learning and the sharing. And I think that's what's really uh, sent our profession in, the, in the, the, right, the right direction. Yeah, and if you haven't had a chance to check out an ISB convention, it's the best way you could spend your time. No matter where it is, get it on the calendar and find a way to get there. You won't be sorry about that. And kind of in keeping with the mission of, of, of moving the base forward, I, 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 could you talk just a bit about starting the Bradovich Foundation, what it is and your motivations for, for starting that? Uh, I founded this foundation, the um, Bradovich Foundation, um, what was it, 2008. And it too was a reaction on to the profession and where we had gone with the, the profession had really improved internally especially and I saw the next step is trying to take us outside of the base world and try to sell us to the general public and a number of people have done this individually uh, but it's always stronger when it's collectively done so the, the focus of the, uh, the foundation is to hold a competition that draws the very best players in the world to do that, we had to have the largest prizes we could, which includes uh, 10,000 cash, a New York debut in Carnegie Recital Hall, uh, CD recording, and then as many concerts as we can. And not just concerts for bass players, but trying to break into the, you know, the more general public. And so that's the, the main focus of the, of the foundation. And uh, we are now hosting our, our second competition, uh, September 1 through 5, at uh, my school, UNT. The, and the winner of the first competition, a fabulous bassist named Artem Cherkov, who is currently principal bass of the St. Petersburg Philharmonic. I had a chance to get together with him in San Francisco when he was coming through town, see him play a recital, just phenomenal bassist, and he, we chatted about how, how much winning that and what the foundation has done for him has helped his career, and you've got to hear this player. He's like nobody you've ever heard, and in fact, You'll be able to hear this player because... Yes, I brought uh, some of his CDs here and I would like to, on behalf of the Foundation and Artem, to uh, give each of you one. So as soon as the concert's over tonight, I'll bring out a box and please don't leave without it. It's a uh, beautiful time. And, and as I, I just have to add this, in, in San Francisco, Artem played his recital, and then he gets up and he and someone starts snapping, two and four, and Artem sings like I left my heart in Texas. Oh, <laughs> so, so like in his Not amazing really. in his amazing Russian accent, and uh, and yeah, so he's he's uh, he's a Texas he's a fan kid, for for sure. Kid. And I wanted to say one more thing about this, this whole development of the double bass is when we started the conventions, uh, people were like, well, what's that? And then a few years later, about three years later, I started my summer master classes, which are now in their 30th year this, this summer. And I think the first year we had maybe six or seven people come. And people were like, well, what, what is that? What do we do? It, it didn't exist before that. And now we get as, you know, I think a couple of years ago, would we have uh, uh, 97 bass players on stage for the concert. And it's not just that, but because 
it was meeting a need of the profession pretty soon other people started doing it and pretty soon other people started doing it pretty soon everybody's doing it and then george emery had the 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 gall to start one down here where there were no bass players and we see in is in really 10 years which is a very short period of time uh stellar students on the stage i'm really very very impressed blown away by the the quality and uh so shout out to george On, on behalf of the base community, I, mean, I just want to thank you for everything you've done. You've been such an inspiration to me, to so many people here, to all of us. And so thank you for what you do with, with your own work and the Bradditch Foundation. And it's real, obviously made a tremendous impact and continues to do so. So thank, thanks, thanks for everything, Jeff. Thank you. And I'd like to welcome to the stage somebody who's been involved with the Bradditch master classes for I think this is his 15th year. I had the pleasure of going to them when I was, I think I was 15 years old and totally transformative. I'd uh, like to bring up Jack Ensiker to the stage. So two, two facts about Jack that, I, that I, I'd like to share, maybe we can start there. Um, one, he's from Juneau, Alaska, which I don't know anybody from Juneau, Alaska. Certainly not have any bass players, so that's, that's interesting. What was, what was it like growing up in Juneau? Uh, well, for everyone, the place you grow up is the place you grow up, you know, whether that be in, in uh, Africa or in Alaska or in South Texas. So, you don't have too much to compare it to. Uh, so home was home. Um, it was a really special place. Um, I realized later after leaving, uh, because it was a very small community, uh, it's about 30,000 people now, and there are no roads out of the town. You have to take a boat or a plane to get to Juneau just because of the geography that surrounds the area. So uh, very tight community because of that. You know, it's the same people all of the time. And as kids, we were able to run around a lot and there's you know, very little danger of us getting picked up and taken away somewhere or anywhere we went there were people that knew us and knew our parents and so we had a lot of freedom that I think you don't get in the you know larger metropolitan areas and yeah I was I didn't really see anyone play the double bass until I was in college which was the other you know, kind of surprising part about that that to be a professional musician uh, my perspective on that was that that meant that you had a day job all of the best musicians in the town, like the best jazz pianist, he worked at a CD store during the day that my brother also had the same job while he was a high school student. So, And uh, some of the great musicians were high school teachers or working for the state of Alaska. And it wasn't until I was you know, in my 20s that I even knew that uh, being a professional musician was a possibility, that that would be your day job. And so it was a little isolated in that regard to grow up in that community. but. Um, once I got down to the lower 48, as we call the, these states, uh, yeah, I just <laughs> found out what was possible as a, as a musician. I knew I would always do it for uh, the rest of my life, but um, knowing that I could actually do it as a career didn't come to me until much later than I think most people that are here and see people that work in the field as professionals. Well, that, that brings us to the, the second f fact about Jack, which is that you're, you're definitely one of the, you've started later than just about anybody you know or I know that's working as a professional bassist. How old were you when you picked up the bass? Uh, I started at 21 years old when I started playing double bass. I was a junior in my undergrad, and so the first day that I was playing the double bass, I was um, in the orchestra and we were doing Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. That was day one. I had a, <laughs> had a German bow from... Uh, the percussion studio that had like 15, 16 hairs on it, <laughs> standing there with the school bass, like, all right, yeah, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> and uh, I thought, you know, I jazz bass um, um, as, a, as I was growing up, and I thought, you know, E string, A string, D string, G string, I'll pick it up, how hard could it be? <laughs> no frets, it's huge, I can what, you know, only use three fingers. And, um, and then one of the real funny moments I remember was, uh, when I had all of this stuff to deal with, balancing the instrument, trying to play in tune, and trying to draw sound with this bow, and, and then somebody saying, you know, 
uh, you know, marking the part, and it's like, wait, you're telling me people care which way the bow is going? <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> so, um, but uh, I can I can say that uh, there, as bass players, it's it's much more common to have people start older, um, mostly because of the size of the instrument that we have to grow to a certain size and. Um, but now we have smaller and smaller fractional instruments available and great teaching. And so now we're seeing the young players and the, the level of the youngest bass players now is just phenomenal. Um, at ISB, I'm going to be one of the solo competition judges for uh, 14 and under. And I am so ready to just have my mind blown. I mean, we hear all of the young players here and it's really going to be astounding to hear what the, uh, the youngest, the level of the youngest players is really going to be great. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. We're the same age, basically. Like, even in our time, like, the difference between, you know, when we were both starting college and now is just, like, in, incomparable. It's, it's, it's so dramatically improved. Were you in a KISS cover band? <laughs> no. No? <laughs> he, was, he was asking about um, trying to find some funny photos from our youth when we looked like rockers, and uh, actually, sent you a photograph of the band Queensryche. Oh, <laughs> well, that shows like you this. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, there was a guy, one of them kind of looks like you. Okay. <laughs> the, there are some pictures like that, of the one that Jason's referring to is one of him with the long hair and, and, and looking uh, like he was going to be in a hair band sort of thing. And there are some photos of me like, floating around. Like, I think there are some of most of the professors that are here <laughs> have hair a little bit longer than they do now, and probably more hair than yeah. There's one that I wasn't able to find of Jeff Bradditch wearing a sombrero uh, from the first one, but I, I, couldn't, I couldn't look at that. So, so speaking of, of uh, Jeff, uh, you ended up going to North Texas and studying? Right. right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, a little bit about my progression was I was a jazz studies major for my undergrad and when I finished that degree I went to the Hammond Ashley Clinic as one of the, the summer workshops that Mr. Braditich has been teaching at for some time and here, here's how the progression worked for me was that I heard Mr. Braditich play and I had no idea that playing like that was even possible on the instrument and decided I was going to come and study with him and came to North Texas, went to Denton, Texas. I had no idea where Denton, Texas was. Uh, it could have been anywhere and I was still gonna go. And I got off the airplane and the first sign I saw, the first exit, it said, Pro Bass, which is the, the Pro Bass shops, but I saw it, I was like, this is, this is the right place, I've made a good choice. Um, and then I got to North Texas and um, then everybody was playing in this way that I didn't know was possible on the bass and they're 18 and 19 years old and by this time I'm you know 25 years old and, and uh, yeah so I, I hit the practice room a lot <laughs> as much as I could and now you've been you know fast forward a few years and and you're te te professor at uh, UT Arlington and you play says like 60 performances a year at least on top of that with Fort Worth and some other sure. ensembles right and and then you've also been working at the Bradditch master classes for the last 15 years yeah I, I started coaching helping out to coach the ensembles you know part of the summer workshops are that we have quartets and trios and sextets and, and groups like that so I was helping out while I was grad student and uh, just kind of started doing different roles and, and uh, doing whatever really needs to be done. That's basically what my job description is there to help out and play on the faculty recitals and help with the administrative stuff and coach and, and just whatever needs to be done. Yeah. You know? and, uh, what are some of your favorite things about either the work, work, you know, working with at an event like Villa El Bajo or the Bradditch master classes? What do you enjoy most about working with these younger players? Um, that's that's hard to put to pick one thing in particular. Um, this is a bit of a reunion here because uh, uh, George Amram and Carlos Gaviria and his wife Janice and we all went to school together, and so we come back here and it's a, a bit of a reunion to catch up with old friends and um, but just like the students get inspiration from here, I, I as well also feel really inspired to come and watch great teaching and and to see 
all right, I'm listening to a student in a master class and to see what are, what are these other great teachers going to pick up on and what sort of influence can they have? How do they share the ideas and communicate the ideas? And then the faculty recitals, the student recitals. I mean, it's, there's so much inspiration from these types of events. And uh, it's something that really lasts a long time. Like the ISB, for example, is so condensed with great things that it's good in a way that they only happen every other summer because I still don't feel like I've been able to process all of the inspiration and all of the information that just is streaming at you. Um, I heard this description recently and it's, it's perfect. It's like drinking from a fire hose <laughs> you know, where you go to take a sip of water and it just blasts you for an entire week. So, so yeah, I would say it's, it's a, that was definitely not one favorite thing. <laughs> yeah, but no, but that's a favorite thing of mine too. And it's like, and the, what you learn at, at events like this, or ISB, or the Bradley's master classes. Yeah, it's so much to take home and process, and throughout the year when you're back in here. Right, it's a mix of community because the people are such a huge part of these events. Just getting to meet new people, like um, meeting Lloyd Goldstein for the first time, and. Yeah. Um, Alex Ritter, so many, so many of the great teachers that are here, and, and uh, to see them work, and yeah, it's fantastic. Well, congratulations, congratulations on what you do, and it was great to see you. you work with the students, a fabulous master class, and uh, so great to finally meet you in person. That's a treat. Thanks, Thanks for chatting. All right, we have one more person to get up here, and then we're going to have the uh, the students perform. But before before we have them come up, I'd just like to have Mark Morton come up, who's going to be conducting the group. And it's great to see Mark again. So welcome, Mark. So you are a, you were born in Texas. That's right, I'm originally from Texas, mostly Houston. Houston, so, okay. And I've, I've been out of the state for most of my career for 29 years, uh, six years in New York City where I went to school at Juilliard, and uh, for 23 years I was in uh, the Columbus, Ohio Symphony Orchestra, 14 years as principal bass, and uh, I am so thrilled to be back here in my home state. I've been able to reestablish contacts with so many people, it's, it's actually been uh, mind-blowing. So I'm, I'm so happy to be back in my home state to share many of the things that I experienced and learned uh, in, in the East Coast uh, and in Europe. Um, it's, uh, pinch me. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that, so Mark, Mark's in so many interesting things in his career. I mean, you won the ISB solo competition. What year was that again? Uh, 1990. 1990, okay. Back. And, Thank oh, you, Jeff, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and you, you've written several technique books over the years. I've, I've had them all on my shelf, you know. The, the, the well, you need to put them on your music stand. <laughs> well, they kind of on your music stand. <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, and then one of the things that I always thought is, is interesting about your career in musical background is, is you're a pianist, and you're a pretty darn good pianist. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I do the best I can. Um, and I certainly, yes, playing the piano is a very, very big part of my life as a musician, who I am as a musician, and certainly uh, as I am as a teacher. I accompany all my students. My students at Texas Tech University don't know how easy they have it because they don't have to find a pianist, they don't have to pay for one, uh, and they get um, really rehearsal uh, every single lesson. That way they, they learn the entire piece. Uh, um, because I would say that at least half of any piece, most pieces, uh, is really in the accompaniment, so they get the, the full picture uh, of, of the piece. So, uh, yes, it's an important part of what I, what I do. When did you come to the bass? Well, I started playing the bass and the piano at exactly the same time, uh, almost exactly on my 11th birthday. Uh, so, um, of course, the bass is the most important uh, uh, thing that I do. Uh, but in that way, they're really sort of equal partners uh, in, in my background. 
How do you think uh, playing the piano is, is a super broad question, so apologies, but how do you think playing the piano has shaped you as a bass player? Most bass players aren't, if they play piano, aren't at the level of proficiency that you are. How, how do you think that's shaped your double bass development? Uh, well, I think I have a, a broad spectrum, literally, um, of what the music is. Um, uh, the the harm, harmony of the music is, is a big, big part. I'm very, very clear as to what the harmonic structure is of uh, anything uh, that I'm playing. And also, when I uh, uh, interpret solo double bass music, I, I learn the piano part. Uh, so it's really, again, an interpretation uh, of the full uh, piece. So it's, it's very important. And the technique, there's many things from the technique and the aesthetics. That's very, very important, the standards and, and the aesthetic values that um, I grew up in with the piano, um, I like to apply to the bass. And as um, uh, Jeff Bredetich said, the standards of double bass playing over the past few decades has skyrocketed, and it's really exciting to be able to apply that same sort of aesthetic, artistic standard to really my favorite instrument, uh, the double bass. And I was speaking with George uh, earlier and just about ways in which you've been involved, what you've done uh, for Viva El Bajo before, at the school yes. floor, and it's always so very interesting. What, what have you done in the past? Well, I, um, I, I like to do all sorts of different things. I guess it was last year I did a um, orchestral excerpt jukebox. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> where I uh, gave a list of, I don't know, there's about 25 uh, orchestral excerpts, and I just asked the audience, what do you want me to play for you? And, uh, and then I projected the, the uh, image of the music up on the big screen here, uh, uh, and we talked about the piece, uh, the excerpt, um, at, at length. Uh, I had done the complete Marcello Sonatas, uh, in, in years past. I, I try to do, I'm really interested in so many uh, varied things. Um, this go around, I played the uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth cello suites uh, right in a row, right here on this stage. Boy, my arm's tired. I'll bet. I was getting tired just watching. I don't, I don't know how you do that. I love the orchestral jukebox. That should be in every diner. We've That's right. Kind of yeah, different well, kind of jukebox. Yeah, right? I don't know. They, they might not be so popular, but yeah. <laughs> maybe golden oldies or something. <laughs> well, it's great to see you again, Mark. I've been a fan for years. I've had Thank you on you. the podcast before, and just appreciate everything you're doing. And let's get let's get all the players yes, up here. We're going to be doing something really different now. Uh, yes, our young bass players, let's come up on stage, shall we? We're going to do something crazy. Yes, young bass players, let's hear for you.